Okay, our next unit will be reading the Jane Austen novel Persuasion. Jane Austen is someone I'm sure you have all heard of. She was an early 19th century novelist and one of the most important women novelists in the history of the novel, not just English literature, but in the development of the modern novel. Um, so let's first talk a little bit about the histor historical background, uh, and then I will introduce the author, and then I will talk about the book. Uh, and then finally, I will guide you to understand how to use this unexpectedly thick handout. So late 18th century, early 19th century. The last time we talked about British history, we were talking about the uh, English Civil War, which ended in uh, 1660. Um, after that was a relatively calm period in the domestic sphere. Most of Britain's energy was spent on expansion and empire, exploring the world, becoming a naval power. However, a few, a couple of very important events happened in the 18th century that is related to uh, this time period. The first is the American Revolution, War of Independence, uh, which started in 1775. Uh, the reason for the Americans wanting to leave the empire, first of all, was because King George the, I can't remember which King George, I think King George V uh, was kind of crazy. They say that he was drinking uh, lead water with lead poisoning or something. Anyway, he was kind of crazy. Uh, and he insisted on um, spending more and more money in expanding the empire and uh, defending his overseas assets. And if he could not raise taxes on the British people, he would have to raise taxes on the colonies, Zimingdi. And this is very convenient for him because if he tries to propose a higher tax on British people, the parliament can object. Uh, the people get angry, they will talk to their legislators, their legislators will go to parliament and vote down any new tax. But if he proposes a new or higher tax on the colonies, the colonies do not have representatives. When the, the colonists are angry and uh, want to object, there's no way for them to, uh, uh, to express their objections. So, uh, over the course of the second half of the 18th century, um, taxes in what is today the United States um, started going higher. There were higher taxes on postage, uh, uh, there were higher taxes on luxury products like tea. Uh, and finally, the American colonists could not take it anymore. Um, they decided to protest peacefully. So there were events like the Boston Tea Party, where some uh, colonists dressed up as American Indians, ran onto British tea ships and threw their tea overboard into the sea as a kind of protest. Um, and as these actions grew more and more, finally, uh, King George sent in the army to keep the peace, as he calls it. Uh, and the army uh, shot at peaceful protesters in Lexington, Massachusetts in, I believe, also 1775. And that started the civil, uh, the War of Independence. Now, at the time, uh, the North American colonies were divided into 13 different colonies. Each colony had its own government, it had its own leaders, had its own Militia, uh, militias, Ming Bing. Uh, so there's no official army. So the American Revolution is not just about fighting against Britain. It's also about finding common ground among all the other colonies uh, at the time. 
Uh, and so one of the first things they decided to do was to come together and produce a single document uh, declaring why they are fighting against Britain. And that document is, of course, the Declaration of Independence. Um, the Americans won the war with the help of the French, because at the time the French were also trying to expand their colonies overseas and saw the English as their enemy. So, you know, the enemy of your enemy is your friend. Um, so they win in 1783. So 1775 to 1783. And then the hard work began for the Americans of forming a new country with a new constitution and new laws. That is for my American literature class, if you're interested. Now we're coming back to British history. The other main important event prior to the uh, period of Jane Austen is the French Revolution of 1789. The French Revolution is very different from the American Revolution. The American Revolution was led by landowners, Dijou, by uh, upper middle class people who were protesting that they did not have enough power to decide how much tax to pay. The French Revolution was led by working people against aristocrats in their own land. Uh, so they're not fighting for a bigger voice. They're fighting for control of the entire country. Uh, the French revolutionaries wanted to transform France from a monarchy, uh, Wang Chen, into a republic, Gong He Guo. And because it's not just about different parts of the ruling class, but different classes, the war was especially bloody. So if you remember from your world history classes in high school, you have things like the reign of terror, Kong Bu Tong Zi. You have people like uh, Maximilian Robespierre, Lo Bo Si Bi, who took on the name of the representative of the people, and he acted like a tyrant, but in the name of the people. And in these kinds of revolutions, there will be disagreements, right? Like, why are you doing this instead of that? I'm part of the people, and I don't agree. So. The reign of terror is not just uh, executing aristocrats. It also turned into executing rivals in the revolution. Uh, you know, round and round we go, right? This group takes power and then another group thinks they're wrong and they kill them and then they take power over and over. Uh, so to end or, or in the middle of this cycle, one of the most powerful leaders ended up being Napoleon, Napoleon. Uh, did you guys see the movie? It was a terrible movie, but uh, some parts are important to know. So for example, Napoleon started out as an artillery man, uh, Pao Bing. So uh, he came up from the army. He knew how to fight. At the time, artillery was considered a kind of shameful part of the army. Uh, the tradition of warfare is manly warfare, one on one. You have to see your enemy. You have to give your enemy a fair chance. And people thought that if you shoot at your enemy from far away, that's unfair. It's cowardly. Uh, so Napoleon was not uh, respected at the beginning. But he was asked to come and settle one of these revolutionary disagreements, let's say, and he did it very effectively. In part because uh, his specialty, artillery, is something that many people did not really uh, know about. They didn't want to learn about it. They thought it was shameful, so they were not prepared for it. When Napoleon brought in his cannons and aimed it squarely at the uh, counter protesters in the streets, people were not prepared for that. Uh, now, of course, today we know better. We know that uh, we have to when you protest, you have to be prepared for everything. So Napoleon gains more and more power. Uh, 
he is not taken down by another group. And in fact, um, during the French Revolution, France is surrounded by monarchies, right? At the time, Spain had a king and queen. Germany, which at the time was called Prussia, Purusi, had a king and queen. France was trying to become the second republic in modern Europe. The first one is the US, which is not in Europe, but you know what I mean. So all the countries around France were looking at what's going on and they were very nervous. All of the rulers and the aristocrats of these other countries were thinking, OK, these French people are fighting among themselves for now. But if they start settling down and start expanding into other countries, we have to stop them. And that's what happened with Napoleon. When Napoleon gained control uh, and he settled all of the disagreements in France, that's when the other countries started getting nervous and that's when they formed the Napoleonic alliances uh, and started to invade France from like different directions and trying to fight against Napoleon. Now, the same reason Napoleon could win in France is the same reason Europe could not win against Napoleon. They were not prepared for, first of all, he's a military genius. Secondly, his specialty is artillery and the other armies were also not very prepared for this. And so uh, throughout the late 18th century and early 19th century, Napoleon kept winning. He uh, got as far south as Egypt uh, and he was starting to push east. He, in history, the farthest he's got was Moscow. Uh, uh, before really starting to lose. Uh, and we can talk about why he started to lose, mostly, mostly because he was a genius, but his, uh, how do I say this? His lieutenants, Tada Fu Jiang, were idiots. Uh, so he had to do everything himself. So the more territory he controlled, the harder it was for him to keep control. And also because like you can only fight war for so long before you start to run out of resources, before the army gets tired, before people are tired of war taxes. Um, so it was kind of inevitable that Napoleon would lose over time, but it also took the combined armies of Europe to beat him. Uh, and he lost twice. First time he lost, he got sent to uh, a small island called Elba. This was, I believe, around 1810, maybe 1815. Um, and then he escaped the island and gathered his army and tried again and quickly lost at Waterloo, Huatelu. And he got sent to another small island called Mount Sa uh, called uh, St. Helena. And that's where he died. So that's Napoleon's story. This is important to know because persuasion was written in 1816, around the time Napoleon finally lost, and the story takes place in the late, uh, around 1810. So the, the story takes place across, I believe it was eight years, on either side of 1810, 1812, in the thick of the Napoleonic Wars. So Jane Austen often writes about domestic stories, about families, about uh, relationships, but you have to know the historical background. What's going on in society during this time? Napoleon never successfully invaded Britain, but only because the British Navy was so good at keeping him in Europe. So uh, the story uh, one of the main characters of this story is a naval captain, Hai Jiang, or not Hai Jiang, Chuan uh, Zhang, I think. Uh, so when we talk about his job and his history and his possible future, you have to remember that at this time, Britain was at war with France in the Navy. Right. I think that's enough history to understand this story. Jane Austen, uh, grew up in the upper middle class. So her family was not poor, but also not very rich. She had a, a generally comfortable early life. 
But whereas women of the time were expected to get married and to form good connections with other families, uh, Austin herself remained single for the rest of her life, for all of her life, and she put her energy into writing novels. She wrote, I believe, six novels. Two of them were published after she died. Uh, and one of those novels is Persuasion. Persuasion is the last novel that she completed. Uh, first edition was 1816. I think she died in 1817, so the very next year. That's probably wrong. Persuasion came out after she died. So she finished it in 1814, 1815. She died, and then the book came out. So it really was the last book that she finished. Um, now, because of Austin's personal background, most of her stories also are about upper class people. Um, so at the time, Britain was also a monarchy. It was actually a feudal monarchy, Fengjian Wangquan. So uh, the ruling class were all royalty, were all related to the king and queen in some way. The connection that com that binds the ruling class together is a binding of is a connection of blood, bloodline. So power for the upper class is related to how close you are to the king and queen. Because if the king and queen die, then there is a succession, right? Uh, so like the closer to the king and queen you are, the more likely you are to become king or queen. Um, and it's true if you are like three steps away, it's not very likely. If you're 10 steps away, it's probably not going to happen. But the logic of this upper class society is the closer you are to the king and queen, the more power you have, the more the higher status you have in society. So you, we will see that most of these upper class people are very obsessed about going to parties, about meeting the right people, about marrying the right people so that they can increase their power, their status or their money or hopefully all three. But as you can probably guess from Jane Austen's personal history, uh, she herself did not care a lot about this kind of status. And so in many of her books, her main characters also are people who don't care too much about this or they start by caring a lot and then later realize that it's not that important to uh, leave, leading a good life. Uh, but it's important to understand this logic so that we understand what everybody else is thinking, why they do what they do. Uh, OK, so sometimes people say that, oh, Jane Austen's books are for girls or for women, which is, of course, not true. Even if you are a guy, you still have to care about uh, personal relationships. You should still care about how other people see you, whether they think you are valuable uh, and like what's going on in your part of society. Um, it's not connected with traditional ideas of masculinity, right? Uh, what was it going out to hunt or like to go out to, to make money? Um, but it is still part of human life, whether you are a man or a woman, uh, to understand social dynamics. So uh, Guanxi. And because the these Jane Austen's books are so focused on social dynamics, there are many interactions that are very subtle. Uh, if you don't pay attention to what you're reading, you may not catch what's going on. Why did somebody feel offended? Why did somebody feel like the other person loves them? We'll talk about this as we read. Uh, so that's Jane Austen. Any questions so far? OK, uh, so that's the history part. Now we're moving into the literature part. Why is Jane Austen such an important novelist? She's considered one of the earliest novelists to use uh, modern writing techniques. So in the history of the novel, early novels were based on nonfiction, biography, travelogues, 
uh, lists of facts, letters. There were not at the very beginning, novels were not really understood, so they tried to copy other forms of texts so that readers would would kind of understand what's going on. So readers knew that they were reading something that did not actually happen, but using these other genres or other formats uh, helped readers to understand the information that was being presented to them. So if you never if you had never read a story before, you had at least read letters before. So if a novelist writes a novel in letters, you would understand what's going on, uh, even if the story is completely uh, fake. Uh, but around Austin's time, authors started trying to directly tell stories, usually in the first person, I, I did this, I did that. Um, and usually as a kind of eyewitness account. So like think of a witness in a court trial. A lawyer calls them to the stand and they have to talk about what they saw, what they heard, what they did. That kind of idea. But starting around with Jane, uh, Jane Austen is the, the most prominent example. Starting with Jane Austen, she didn't just do that. She also tried to shift perspectives into different characters. So yes, the novel has a main character called I. Who refers to herself in the first person. But there are also sections of the novel that this character would not know about. It's knowledge that only other characters would know. And so when Austin writes about these events, she's leaving the perspective of her protagonist and entering the mind of another character. This was completely new uh, in the history of the novel. Because in real life, you don't know what other people are thinking. You don't know what other people have witnessed or have experienced unless they tell you. And if they tell you, then you can always say, I heard him say, I heard her say. But when Austin directly jumps into the viewpoint of another character, that is literally impossible. So starting with this kind of novel, we are leaving behind uh, the nonfiction format. So some say that this is the birth of the modern novel. Now, because Austin is one of the first novelists to do this, she doesn't do it very well. There are some places where she tries to shift perspective and it doesn't quite work. For example, when we talk about quotations, if you're taking my grammar class, you will probably uh, recognize some of what I'm saying. When we talk about quotations, either we say, uh, I heard him say that blah, blah, blah. OK, I heard him. No, wait, wait. Uh, OK, she said that she wanted to go home. All in the third person, do these Ironson. Or you might say she said, quote, I want to go home. Right, Di uh, Yuan In the second example, it's a quotation, Yong. But Austin will sometimes accidentally mix these two. She will say, she said, quote, she wanted to go home, which is technically wrong. Uh, because if you actually heard her say that, it should be, I want to go home. Uh, and then uh, sometimes, uh, the grammar is also not exactly the same as it is today. Very close, very close. Uh, but some sentences might be a little bit confusing if you don't know what's going on. Yeah, so when we read, we should pay attention uh, to changes in perspective and um, use of quotations. And also irony. Because Austin started changing perspectives, she could also introduce irony into the story. Now, in Chinese, we think of irony as something like criticizing a character or something. That's not always true. The definition of irony is that the surface looks different from what's actually going on. 
is irony. So, uh, in fact, we see a lot of irony on the very first page. Um, because Austin changes perspectives, when she's talking about a, a, a character that the main character cannot uh, understand, like so when she changes perspectives, the person who is talking on the page cannot be the main character. I'll tell you right now, the main character's name is Anne. So when we're reading about something that Anne cannot know, the person who tells us this information cannot be Anne. We can say that it is Austin herself telling us. We can also say that Austin creates a character who knows everything, and that character is telling things to us. That character does not exist in the world of the novel. It is a function. It's a tool to help her give us information that Anne would not know. That character is called the narrator, Shi Shi Zhe. Um, personally, I think it's just easier to think of the narrator as just Austin herself. So you have the author and then you have various characters. The idea here is that when something when you read something and it feels ironic, like it's telling us something, but with a kind of disagreeing attitude, that attitude does not come from Anne. It does not come from a character. It comes from Austin herself. So by shifting perspectives, Austin also creates a space between the author and her characters. And that space is called ironic distance. You have to have distance in order to let your reader know that the surface is different from what's actually going on. Uh, irony is everywhere in this book. So uh, later on, I will guide you through the first few pages and I will keep saying this is ironic. This is a joke. This is irony. This is a joke. Um, and you'll see that you really have to try to understand like when Austin is telling you something directly. Or, and when is she telling you, but also giving you some kind of value judgment? Uh, one more thing about the text. Um, it likes to use a sentence structure that does not make sense in Chinese. And this structure is comparing two very different things. Uh, in English, there's a saying, you can't compare apples with oranges. Unfortunately, that's exactly what Jane Austen does. Um, so. Uh, we're, we'll see an example of that on the first page as well, but when you see this kind of sentence comparing two very different things, please remember that it is comparing the extent or degree. Like a so the extent of this is similar to the extent of that, which means these two things are similarly important or the the character feels these two things similarly strongly i'll say that in chinese that's the logic behind these kinds of sentences okay uh, so let's take a look at the structure of the handout. The handout is the entire book. And we're going to spend six weeks reading it. Each week we will read four chapters. Now, four chapters sounds like a lot, but it's not really. Look, chapter one, right? One page, two pages three pages and we get to chapter two. Chapter two, one page, two page, three pages, we get to chapter three. So it's not that much. Uh, the chapters get a little bit longer later, but we start off easy. Um, most of the language is very similar to modern English. The grammar is almost exactly the same. Um, the the main um, 
exception in terms of grammar is usage of commas. It uses a very traditional British use of commas. Basically, if the commas feel confusing to you, you can ignore some of the commas and try again. Uh, this traditional use of commas is not according to logic. It is according to the uh, breathing rhythms of the reader. The idea is that uh, writing and novels at in this period were still based on an oral tradition. So like when a lot of people at the time still could not read, uh, usually what would happen is you would have one person in a family who knew how to read, and after dinner, uh, everybody would gather around that person, and then that person would read a book to the rest of the family. So Austin was writing in an oral tradition. So so the grammar is not for exactly logical. The use of commas is not exactly logical. It is to tell the reader when they can pause and take a breath. So if you get confused by the commas, just ignore a few of them and see if it makes sense. Now, the grammar is almost exactly the same as today's, but the vocabulary can sometimes be tricky. Uh, often the meaning of the, uh, the word that Austin uses will still exist today, but the meaning will be different. Um, later on, I will guide you through the first few pages and we will see some examples of words with older or slightly different meanings. So just like for the first half of the semester, I recommend that you check an English to English dictionary. If you check a English to Chinese dictionary, it may not give you the older meaning. If you check Google Translate, it will only give you like five meanings and like only two of them are right. I don't know what would happen if you asked ChatGPT, uh, but I don't trust it. So uh, I recommend using an English to English dictionary and um, Usually the less common definitions will be put lower, so keep scrolling until you get to a meaning that makes sense. The footnotes. So in the uh, Paradise Lost handout, there were two kinds of notes, but in Persuasion, there's only footnotes at the bottom. And uh, these footnotes either give you information about that time in history or gives you information about some of the allusions or it sometimes explains concepts that we do not use today or that uh, you may not know if you don't live in England. Sometimes it translates words with uh, less common meanings so that you know exactly what Austin is trying to say. Um, but these footnotes are more for information and less for translation. Um, so if you're having trouble with something and there's a footnote, you can always check, but it may not help. Uh, OK, and uh, one more thing is because this novel is about social dynamics, there will be a good number of characters. Uh, I'd say around the same number of characters as in Tis Pity She's a Whore, the play. Uh, but the good point, the good part of this is uh, you don't have you don't meet all of the characters across 50 pages. You meet all of the characters across 168 pages, so you have more time to get to know them, to remember who they are. Uh, and to keep them straight in your mind. OK, uh, questions about that introduction. So the textbook that I took this from actually has a really long 50 page introduction, and I uploaded it to Moodle if you are interested in looking through that. 
but I, I didn't give it to you because this is already thick enough. OK, uh, so very quickly, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen next week. Next week, we're going to watch the movie version uh, of this book. There are actually two versions. There is an older uh, made for TV movie by the BBC. And there is a newer one on Netflix starring Dakota Johnson, Henry Golding and Cosmo Jarvis that premiered, I think, last year or two years ago. We're going to watch the older one for two reasons. One, the newer version is too long. We don't have enough time. And the second reason is simply because the newer version is so bad. It's really terrible. Like I tried to watch it and I kept skipping because I didn't want to throw up. So we're going to watch the older version. The older version is also more accurate to the book. Not there will always be differences between a book and a movie, but the older version is closer. Um, so when you do the final exam, the movie might help you remember, but you must always check the book and you must give evidence from the book, not the movie. One more thing about the movie, the uh, the version that I found had terrible Chinese subtitles, so I uh, retranslated the whole thing for you guys. Not for you, I did this two years ago, but I, I'm using the same subtitles that I did for this class. Um, so if you want to pay me for my work, I would welcome that. Uh, you can pay me by doing better on the final exam. OK, questions. OK, if you don't have questions, let's take an early break. Please come back when the bell rings and we'll read the first chapter together.
All right, let's take a look at this book. Persuasion has 24 chapters. We're doing four chapters per week for six weeks, which is exactly 24 chapters. My math is so great. Um, the original edition was published in two volumes. Volume one was chapter one to 12, and then volume two was chapter 13 to 24. Um, this version has combined the two volumes, has corrected some of Jane Austen's uh, slightly weird spelling, uh, but has kept most of the original uh, sentence structure and grammar. Um, so if for the final exam, you go online and you look for information and it says something like volume two, chapter one, what that means is chapter 13. OK, Persuasion, Jane Austen, 1816, chapter one. Sir Walter Elliot of Kellynch Hall in Somersetshire. So we have a, a dude. He is uh, part of the aristocracy. Sir, right? Sun Si. Um, Kellynch Hall is his home. Kellynch is the name of his estate, Zhuangren. The hall means it is the primary building. And it's usually where the owner lives. Uh, but on the estate, there will be at least one guest house, ke fang, like literally fangzi. Uh, and there will also be peasants, dianong. Uh, we're not going to see a lot of the peasants because they're not upper class, but they do live there. Uh, and the uh, general location is Somersetshire which I believe is in the uh, middle but eastern part of the UK. I might be wrong about this. I'm not too clear about UK geography, but you can go online and check the location if you're interested. Uh, like uh, English locations ending in sure are usually traditional geo geographical names. So this guy, Sir Walter Elliot. Also notice the spelling. Today we spell the name Elliot with two T's, but Austin named her characters Elliot with one T. So this guy was a man who, for his own amusement, never took up any book but the Baronetage. The Baronetage is a book that records every family in the upper class and records the family relationships, records the life history of every family. So this sentence says that the only book he reads is the book about being part of the upper class. And it's not literature, it's information. There, he found occupation for an idle hour. Idle means doing nothing. Therefore, occupation does not mean a job. It, it means doing something. So there he found occupation for an idle hour means there he found something to do for when, whenever he was bored. And consolation in a distressed one. One what? One hour. Hour here just means time. Uh, so when he's bored, he found something to do by reading the book. And when he was distressed, so like uh, in a negative mood, he found consolation or comfort in the same book. It's the, like the most important thing, the most important object in his life. There, his faculties were roused into admiration and respect. Faculties, OK. So in the philosophy of that period, they believed that humans had abilities not just to think, but also to sense and also to feel. So today we we call these uh, intellect or intelligence. Uh, sense is like a perception. 
and feeling is like emotion or empathy. These are the faculties, so abilities that are related to using your brain. So you can say like his mind. Or roused into admiration and respect, so to rouse means to wake up. So it's like when he's bored, his mind is shut down, but when he reads the book, he can feel admiration. He can feel respect. How? By contemplating the limited remnant of the earliest patents. A patent is when the king or queen creates a new part of the bloodline or like uh, says that somebody is now part of the aristocracy, gives them a title, gives them some land. That is called a patent. A remnant is what is left. So a limited remnant means that there are not many left. So this sentence means when he considers how few of the original royal family lines still exist. 然后当他发现大部分血脉都已经断后了，他越看越开心， because he himself is still part of this uh, aristocracy. So, like the fewer bloodlines there are, the less competition he has. There, any unwelcome sensations arising from domestic affairs. Domestic here means household. Any unwelcome sensations changed naturally into pity and contempt. Pity here is a good thing. It's sympathy. As he turned over the almost endless creations of the last century, Creation is when the king creates a new title. And there, if every other leaf were powerless, he could read his own history with an interest which never failed. Leaf means page. Every other leaf means every second page. Uh, so even if. Uh, he was not able to get comfort from reading most of these names. He could at least read his own history, and he would always be interested in his own history. So we're starting to get a sense of what kind of person he is. This was the page at which the favorite volume always opened. This sentence is also very interesting. It uses the passive voice, or not passive voice. It The subject of the sentence is the book. It's saying the book opens. Who opens the book? Sir Walter. But it's also saying, like, if you have a favorite book and you keep opening it to the same page over and over, then if you set the book down on a table and just open it, it will naturally go to that page. That's what this sentence is saying. When he sets the book on a table, it naturally opens up to this page about himself. Because this is the page that he keeps reading. Uh, and this is the, the part of the book. Elliot of Kellynchall. Walter Elliot, born March 1st, 1760. Married July 15th, 1784. Elizabeth. Uh, this is his wife, right? Married. This is the person that he married. Daughter of James Stevenson, Esquire of South Park. So this is his father in law. Esquire means ordinary gentleman, it means not an aristocrat, just a regular person. In the county of Gloucester. This place is Gloucester. That's not how it's spelled, but that's how you say it. Gloucester. Uh, so this is where they were, where Elizabeth was from. Uh, by which lady 
who died 1800, so Elizabeth is now dead. He has issue. Issue means children. Elizabeth, uh, so his first daughter is named Elizabeth, born June 1st, 1785. Anne, uh, we will later discover that Anne is our protagonist, born August 9th, 1787. A stillborn son, which means that he died upon birth. November 5th, 1789. Mary, born November 20th, 1791. So we immediately notice two things. One, his wife is dead. Two, he doesn't have a son. Which is very important because again, he's a noble. If he doesn't have a son, then his land and his money and his property and his title go to a different uh, bloodline, the closest adjacent bloodline. So having a son is very important for him. And he doesn't have one. Or sorry, not son. Uh, son or grandson. It, his wife is dead. If he doesn't get a new wife, he can't have a new son. He can only wait for a grandson. Precisely such had the paragraph originally stood from the printer's hands. Such means in this way. So this sentence says, when the book was first printed, right, from the printer's hands, when the book was first printed, this is exactly how it looked. But Sir Walter had improved it by adding for the information of himself and his family, these words after the date of Mary's birth. Married, December 16, 1810, Charles. So Charles is Mary's husband. Son and heir, of Charles Musgrove, Esquire, of Uppercross in the county of Somerset. So Charles's father is also named Charles, and his father is also not a nobleman. He's just a regular gentleman, Esquire. And by inserting most accurately the day of the month on which he had lost his wife. So it's the original text says that uh, his wife died in 1800. He added the exact date of his wife's death. Then followed the history and rise of the ancient and respectable family in the usual terms. Uh, so the book then gives the history of the Elliot family. How it had first it had been first settled in Cheshire, how mentioned in Dugdale, uh, Dugdale, the reference is in the footnote. The ancient usage and bearing of such ensigns of ever. It's another book about being a noble family. Serving the office of high sheriff. A sheriff is like a police captain. Representing a borough in three successive parliaments. So his ancestors were also members of parliament. Exertions of loyalty. So things that his family did for the king and queen and dignity of baronet. So this is when his family was first created part of the nobility. A baronet is a very low level of noble. I think in Chinese we call this like nanjue or something, very low level. But this is why his name is Sir Walter, because he's a baronet. A created baronet in the first year of Charles II, with all the Marys and Elizabeths they had married, forming altogether two handsome duodecimo pages. So this is the size of the page. It's a big page. And concluding, so uh, it takes two pages to finish his family history. Handsome just means beautiful. And concluding with the arms, the arms is like the the sign. Like a someone just 
，因为每个贵族家庭有他的那个叫什么香吗？灰 ，Yes, thank you. Uh, it's the symbol of the family, a crest or a sign. 灰，那个家徽。And motto, uh, 标语 I guess. Uh, prin uh, principal seat, Kellynch Hall, in the county of Somerset. And Sir Walter's handwriting again in this finale. So at the very end. Uh, principal means primary, 主要的 Seat means location. Uh, and then Sir Walter adds this at the end. Heir presumptive, William Walter Elliot Esquire, great grandson of the second Sir Walter. Okay, heir is the person who will inherit the title and the land and the money. Presumptive means if Sir Walter does not have a son or a grandson. Or, uh, yeah. So if Sir Walter does not have a son or grandson, then all of this will be passed on to some guy named William Walter Elliot, who is currently not a noble. He's not in the main bloodline, so he's also Esquire. And it says that he's the great grandson of the second Sir Walter. So if you want to draw the family tree, great grandson is like three generations. So that's like a, a great cousin. So that's the family history. Vanity was the beginning and the end of Sir Walter Elliot's character. So if you looked at his personality from top to bottom, from front to back, all of it was vanity. Uh, narcissism. Vanity of person and of situation. So he cares about him. He, he loves and cares about himself. He also loves and cares about his status, his position in society. He had been remarkably handsome in his youth, and at 54 was still a very fine man. So this gives us his age. And it also gives us the date because it says Sir Walter was born 1760. He is now 54. The date is 1814. And it, that also gives us the ages of everybody else. Uh, if it's 1814, then Elizabeth is. 29, I believe. Right. It, yeah, 29, my, my math is perfect. Uh, Anne is then 27, and Mary is 23. Uh, so Mary is already married, and uh, later we will see that she already has a son at 23 years old. So when Elizabeth is 29 and Anne is 27, we will later see they are not what well, we already see. They are not married. That is already considered very old for single women in this society at that time. OK, so Sir Walter still looks OK, a very fine man. Few women could think more of their personal appearance than he did. So this is our first comparison sentence, right? Then. Think more of means think highly of, which means think that it is good. So the comparison here is that if you compare women who think about their own appearance and you compare Sir Walter and how he thinks about his own appearance, the sentence is saying that Sir Walter thinks he looks better than most women think that they look. You're comparing degree, 在比较程度. So in Chinese, 
Sir Walter 对自己外貌的评价胜过大部分女生对自己外貌的评价。But in English. So now that you understand the sentence, let's look at it again. Few women could think more of their personal appearance than he did. Does that is that more understandable now? So this is the kind of sentence structure that we will keep seeing in this book, comparing two things that really should not be compared. Nor could the valet of any new made lord be more delighted with the place he held in society. Another comparison, right? More delighted uh, here. So what are we comparing? The valet of any new made lord. A valet is a servant. So the idea is a rich guy has a servant and the guy is created into the nobility. He rises from a normal person to a noble person. In this case, his servant would also be very happy. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is the place that Sir Walter held in society. So Sir Walter's own status. And it's saying nor, which is negative, more delighted. So the first one is not more than the second one. You can flip this around. Sir Walter is happier with his situation than a servant whose master's situation has radically improved. Okay. Sir Walter 对自己设经地位的评价胜过如果有一个仆人他的主人突然要升到跃升到贵族之列的那个心情 Okay, so the, again, another comparison. Uh, this, this is a very important sentence structure. Please try to digest and understand this sentence structure uh, so you can understand it when you're reading by yourself. He considered the blessing of beauty as inferior only to the blessing of a baronetcy. Another comparison, inferior means less than. Inferior only to. So we have a ranking. Number one, he is a noble. Number two, he still looks pretty good. In his mind, these are the two most important things. Right? Beauty is only worth less than his noble status. And the Sir Walter Elliot, who united these gifts, was the constant object of his warmest respect and devotion. Object means target. So this sentence is saying that he respects and is devoted to himself most of all. Always. Constant means always. This comma is ungrammatical. In modern English, we would not use this comma. It would be the Sir Walter Elliot who united these gifts. He's uh, it's talking about him in the third person. So the person who all of these good things are put in this person is the same person that he loves and respects. He's talking about himself. Does that make sense? Yeah, OK, great. So this is the only reason why you can add the word the in front of a name if there's more than one this kind of person. His good looks and his rank, Jeji, had one fair claim on his attachment. Uh, fair here means the, the meaning today, like uh, proportionate, gongpingde, the same meaning. Uh, you can even say justified claim on his attachment. A claim on his attachment 
a claim. To claim something means to say that it is yours. So a claim on his attachment is uh, that Sir Walter um, can say that he is attached to his beauty and his rank. But here it's talking about a fair claim. So Sir Walter, as we just saw, loves his beauty, loves his status. But the novel here is saying, or Austin here is saying, most of these reasons are bullshit vanity. But there are, there is one reason for him to love himself that does make sense. This is what a fair claim on his attachment means. So what is this one good reason? Since to them, his good looks and his rank, to them he must have owed a wife of very superior character to anything deserved by his own. So it is because of his good looks and because of his status that he could marry a woman who is so much better than he is. Right. Another comparison, superior character compared to anything deserved by himself. So if it's just person to person, his wife was so much better. But because he has beauty and status, so it makes him a better match for her. Lady Elliot, his wife, right? He's Sir Elliot, uh, Sir Walter Elliot. So his wife was Lady Elliot. Uh, this is another noble title. Lady Elliot had been because she's dead, so past perfect, had been an excellent woman, sensible and amiable. Amiable means friendly. Whose judgment and conduct, conduct means behavior, if they might be pardoned the youthful infatuation which made her Lady Elliot, had never required indulgence afterwards. Okay. Um, so this sentence means she has good sense, she is friendly, and she never did something too extra, or she never lost her head because of her emotions, except for one thing, which is falling in love with Sir Walter. The youthful infatuation. Infatuation means you have a crush on somebody, and Lian Mogoren which made her Lady Elliot. How did she become Lady Elliot? She married Sir Walter. So this sentence is talking about the fact that she fell in love with Sir Walter, and it's talking about this like it's something that she wasn't supposed to do, like it's not a reasonable decision. So if they might be pardoned this event. Pardon means excused or forgive, uh, forgiven. So it, the idea is if you talk about Lady Elliot's judgment and conduct, they never require indulgence. Indulgence is in Chinese zongrong. Uh, like, uh, you know it's not good, but you let them do it anyway. So her judgment and behavior never require indulgence except for when she married Sir Walter. It's the one thing in her life that she did that was not exactly correct. She had humored or softened or concealed his failings. So the things that Sir Walter did not do very well, she either humored, which means to go along with, uh, like in Chinese, the closest idea is like uh, 陪坐, or like uh, in modern English, we have the phrase uh, humor me. Humor me means just hear me out. Uh, so if you humor someone in modern English, that means you don't think it's a good idea, but you're going to listen anyway to at least hear what the idea is. So it's kind of like this is a painting. 
uh, 没有到陪笑 ，because it's still a higher、uh, position， 他是上对下的。So she had humored his failings, or softened his failings, or even concealed his failings.、Uh, to soften his failings is kind of like、uh, 就是帮他缓颊，来帮他找台阶下 ，right? To find social solutions to whenever Sir Walter does something embarrassing, and. She promoted his real respectability for seventeen years. So they were married for seventeen years to promote his real respectability, which means because she was his wife, she helped to improve his reputation, and not just the reputation when you like see him, but his real reputation. 就不只是当面的，呃，见面礼而已，而是真正的名声有。有让他更好。And though not the very happiest being in the world herself, being here just means person, right? Human being. So even though she was not herself the very happiest person in the world, had found enough in her duties, her friends, and her children to attach her to life. <laughs> This is a very depressing sentence. It's saying that her duties as Lady Elliot, and her friendships, and her children, if you put them all together, it made her feel like she didn't want to die right now. Right, attach her to life. She feels like life is still worth living. It is still worth doing things in this life. And make it no matter of indifference to her when she was called on to quit them. Quit here means a quit, which means to give up. So when she finally had to give up her duties, her friends, and her children, it was no matter of indifference. 并不是满不在乎 So she did care.、Uh, why would she have to give all these up? When she died, so the idea is, her duties, friends, and children made her feel like life is worth living, and also made her feel like when she was about to die, it was something that she cared about. Like she wasn't entirely okay with dying.、Uh, and now you know why Austin says that she is not the veriest. The very happiest being in the world. Three girls, the two eldest, sixteen and fourteen, was an awful legacy for a mother to bequeath. A legacy is what you leave behind when you're dead. The verb is bequeath. To leave behind when you're dead, so to bequeath a legacy. Is to leave behind when you're dead the thing that you leave behind when you're dead. So this sentence tells us that when Elizabeth died,、uh, her oldest daughter Elizabeth was 16, and her second daughter Anne was 14. And it, it was not a good, happy situation for her children. It was an awful legacy. An awful charge, rather, to confide to the authority and guidance of a conceited, silly father. Rather means, in other words, it was an awful responsibility. A charge is a responsibility to confide to or entrust to, to fuge, the authority and guidance of a conceited, which means vain. Self-important, silly, so not serious, father, Sir Walter. Today, when we use the word "silly," we you know we talk about children, right? Oh, they're playing; they're so silly. Here, it means he is not able to deal with situations seriously. 不会待人处事 She had, however. One very intimate friend, 
a sensible, deserving woman. Deserving here means having high value. Any good thing that happens to her is deserved. Who had been brought by strong attachment to herself to settle close by her. So because this woman was close with Lady Elliot, lived nearby. So she's like she moved to live near them. In the village of Kellynch. So they, she lives on the same estate. Uh, she lives in the guest house. One of the guest houses. And on her kindness and advice, Lady Elliot mainly relied for the best help and maintenance of the good principles and instruction which she had been anxiously giving her daughters. Rely on. Lady Elliot mainly relied on this woman's kindness and advice to give herself, to Lady Elliot give herself help and to help maintain the good principles and teaching that she was giving her daughters anxiously. So the idea is Lady Elliot knows that Sir Walter is undependable. So when she was raising her daughters, she often relied on this friend for kindness and advice. To make sure that she was raising her daughters with good principles and instruction. This friend and Sir Walter did not marry whatever might have been anticipated on that head by their acquaintance. Uh, so this means even though they knew each other, acquainted with each other, and therefore people expected them to marry. Uh, on that head means uh, in that regard, uh, acquaintance just means you know somebody. So uh, this woman is close to his wife. His wife died, but they did not marry. Thirteen years had passed away since Lady Elliot's death. Great, so we can we can confirm this. 16 plus 13, 29. 14 plus 13, 27. Correct. So it has been 13 years and they were still near neighbors and intimate friends and one remained a widower, Guan Fu, the other a widow. So Lady Elliot's friend is a widow. Her husband has died. That Lady Russell, so this is the name of her friend, Lady Russell, also a lady, right? Has a Guizhu. Of steady age and character. This is kind of funny. Steady character, Ge Xing Wen Zong. Very good. Steady age. How do you keep a steady age? So this is not talking about the number of her age, right? This is talking about her maturity. And extremely well provided for. This means she has lots of money. Even today, we use this phrase to be well provided for means to have a lot of money or a lot of income. So uh, she's a widow, so her money is because her husband was rich. Should have no thought of a second marriage. OK, this should actually means. Would. Um, it, let's just call it a British English thing, but it means would. That Lady Russell, the fact that Lady Russell would have no thought of a second marriage needs no apology to the public, which is rather apt to be unreasonably discontented when a woman does marry again than when she does not. So the idea is 
there's no need to think that something strange is preventing them from marrying each other. Uh, Why? Because this public is apt, so tends to be unhappy when a woman does marry again compared to when she does not. So if a woman becomes a widow and does not marry, the public thinks it's fine. But if she does remarry, the public tends to be unhappy. So the fact that Lady Russell did not remarry needs no apology to the public. But, but Sir Walter's continuing in singleness requires explanation. Today we don't say singleness. Today we say singlehood. Be it known then. Uh, so be it known is a conventional opening for an announcement. Austin is pretending that she is announcing something to us. So be it known that Sir Walter, like a good father, uh, having met with one or two private disappointments in very unreasonable applications, prided himself on remaining single for his dear daughter's sake. So the main sentence says that Sir Walter is a good father who remains single to take care of his daughter. Notice he has two unmarried daughters, but this is singular. It says one daughter. And this kind of gives us a hint about his feelings toward his children. He likes one, he doesn't like the other. So that's the main sentence. But what about this part? This means that he had met with one or two private disappointments. So private failures in very unreasonable applications. Application here means pursuit of a marriage. So this part of the sentence is saying that he did try to remarry once or twice, but the women were much better than he was. It was not a good match, and so he failed both times. So in fact, this middle part says the opposite of the main sentence. The main sentence says that he is a good father who takes pride in remaining single to take care of his beloved daughter. But the middle part says only because he tried and failed to marry two other women. This is irony. So like the idea is like the fact is he's single because he can't get married again. Nobody wants him. But he pretends like it is because he wants to take good care of his daughter. For one daughter, his eldest, Elizabeth, he would really have given up anything, which he had not been very much tempted to do. Another example of irony. He loves his oldest daughter so much he would give up anything for her. But his oldest daughter never really asked him to give up anything. Uh, to be tempted, right? So yo ho. The idea is there was no situation where he had to consider giving up anything for his oldest daughter. So it's kind of like an empty boast. Right, he's saying, I would give up anything for my daughter, but really, he never had to really think about it. Right, he, he was never in that situation to really consider how much he would be willing to give up. Elizabeth, his oldest daughter, had succeeded at 16 to all that was possible of her mother's rights and consequence. So even when she was 16, she inherited all of her mother's um, right, let's say duties, 
and status. Remember, Lady Elliot was the woman of the house. After she died, her oldest daughter became woman of the house and had to take up the woman's duties and acquired the woman's status. So that's what this sentence is saying. Elizabeth took up all that was possible of her mother's duties and status. And being very handsome and very like himself, her influence had always been great. So she has uh, an important status in this house. She ha uh, her father is very easily influenced by her. And the novel says this is because she was beautiful and she looked like Sir Walter. So Sir Walter listens to her in part because she looks like him. And also because we know Sir Walter likes beautiful people. And they had gone on together most happily. So like they had continued on like this together with her father very happily. His two other children were of very inferior value. <laughs> this is, of course, from Sir Walter's perspective. Mary, the youngest daughter, had acquired a little artificial importance. So artificial here means like fake. By becoming Mrs. Charles Musgrove, the wife of Charles Musgrove. Uh, in a traditional wedding ceremony, uh, and when you attend like very traditional parties, you will be introduced as Mr. and Mrs. John Smith. So that's what this is doing. Mary's official name is Mrs. Charles Musgrove. But Anne, with an elegance of mind, xing zi hen you ya, and sweetness of character, ge xing tian mei, which must have placed her high with any people of real understanding. So anyone who really understood things and really understood the world would have placed a very high value on Anne was nobody with either father or sister. And yet her father and her sister did not even think of her. To them, she was a nobody. Her word had no weight. Uh, in Chinese, it, this, it's the same, right? Not a saying Her convenience was always to give way. So anytime there was a conflict, she would be the person to give up and to give in to the other person. She was only Anne. So this sentence already tells us Austin's value judgment of this family. Right, we can see that Austin thinks Lady Elliot was a good woman. Lady Russell is a good woman. Anne is a good woman. But Sir Walter is silly and Elizabeth is exactly like him. So we have like a division among the characters. To Lady Russell, indeed, she was a most dear and highly valued goddaughter, favorite and friend. OK, so we, we know friend. We know favorite, right? Somebody you really like. A goddaughter. So uh, England is a Christian society. They also have baptism, so she. When you are baptized, you gain a second set of parents in the church. Uh, and that is your godfather and your godmother, Zhao Fu Zhao Mu. So Lady Russell is Anne's godmother. Uh, the idea is like if your biological parents uh, die or like get into trouble and you need another set of parents, your godparents can be like an alternate set of parents to help take care of you. Lady Russell loved them all, but it was only in Anne 
that she could fancy the mother to revive again. Fancy means imagine. So this is saying that Lady Russell saw her uh, Anne's mother in Anne. She feels like Anne resembles her mother. It's like her mother is alive again. In Chinese, you just see her face and see her A few years before, Anne Elliot had been a very pretty girl, but her bloom had vanished early. Bloom is, of course, what flowers do. A flower blooms, san feng. So this is talking about youthful beauty. Uh, her bloom had vanished early. And as even in its height, her father had found little to admire in her. So even when Anne was most beautiful, her father did not really like her. Uh, so totally different were her delicate features and mild dark eyes from his own. So again, the reason Sir Walter did not like her is because she does not look like him. Different from his own. And we also get a description of Anne. Delicate features. And mild dark eyes. So gentle, dark, like, like probably brown eyes. There could be nothing in them now that she was faded and thin to excite his esteem. So even when she was young and beautiful, her father didn't really like her. Now that she was faded and thin, there is even less that could make her father uh, value her. Excite is the same as arouse. It means to awaken, huanxing. Esteem means a value. He had never indulged much hope. He had now none of ever reading her name in any other page of his favorite work. So he never really hoped that Anne would marry a noble. And now he had no hope at all. Remember, his favorite work is the Book of the Nobility. All equality of alliance, alliance here means marriage, must rest with, uh, with Elizabeth. For, for means because, Mary had merely connected herself, which means married, with an old country family of respectability and large fortune. So the Musgrove family is an old family and very rich. That's it. They are not nobles. And so to Sir Walter, when, uh, when Mary married Charles Musgrove, she had therefore given all the honor and received none. Elizabeth would, one day or other, marry suitably. Uh, he, this is Sir Walter's hope, but really Elizabeth at 29, probably not going to get married anytime soon. She's already kind of too old for marriage. Um, so let's stop here. Let me give you a quick plot summary of what happens Actually, no, I'm not going to give a plot summary. You can watch the movie next week. Um, but I will say it is a romance. Yeah, OK, so let's stop here. Uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to come and ask. Um, next week, we're going to watch the movie. And in within the next two weeks, please finish up to the end of chapter four.